So thank you for having me. My name is John Hubbard. Uh, I work for the SANS Institute. I'm a certified instructor and <coughs> course author for a few of the courses out there. Uh, I teach most of the Blue Team Operations curriculum, uh, which is 511, which is kind of like a senior analyst threat hunting course, uh, Sec 555, which is a SIM with tactical analytics course. And then I co-authored a course on using Elasticsearch as a SIM and then just released a brand new six-day course called uh, Sec 450 Blue Team Fundamentals, which is kind of where this presentation came from and my research in doing that. Uh, that course is meant for people, uh, I wrote the course for a problem I had myself. I was a analyst that kind of came in as an entry level role and had worked my way up to uh, SOC manager at GlaxoSmithKline, the pharmaceutical company. And we were always trying to figure out where do we want to send our newest team members. And so that's kind of what that course is for and what brought this presentation about. And so one of the things I'm very interested in is making sure people are doing the best job as a blue team and also being happy with the job. Uh, I went to a B-Sides conference in Baltimore, I think it was 2016 or 2017, and there was a SOC panel there. And while I was at the SOC panel, uh, it, there was a discussion about the job of being an analyst and the ups and downs of that. And I heard a lot of people saying a lot of like, I don't know, disparaging and kind of like downer sort of stuff about the job. And they're saying, oh, it's a revolving door job, my team is always changing, and it's you know, miserable, and we're doing the same thing every day. And I was sitting in the crowd thinking like, I don't feel like that about my job. Like I really enjoy doing what I do and we don't really have that experience. And so kind of at that point, my interest in that topic was peaked. And uh, through writing this course and talking to a lot of analysts kind of along the way, I started to find some answers to that. And so that is what this presentation is about. And whether or not you work in a SOC or not, there's a lot of really useful info in here about uh, keeping yourself engaged and motivated and happy with the job. So uh, it really applies to everyone, although it's specifically tuned for SOC analysts. So. Uh, with that, let's get started. So first of all, real quick level set on this, right? We do have a problem in information security finding good people. Now a lot of this is from the uh, ISC squared uh, global information security workforce study from uh, the most recent years. And uh, 3 million jobs globally is, is the gap and it's projected to increase. Now I've seen some discussion back and forth on whether the gap is real or not and I'm not here to argue that. Uh, I'm tend to trust the research that was done. But regardless, what I can tell you for sure is if you've ever tried to hire anyone in information security recently, <coughs> it's been very, very difficult to find good people, right? Anyone that's done hiring in the crowd, I'm sure, has found that. Uh, it takes a long time to find the personality match and the talent match and, and all that because there's so many good options out there. So a lot of the time, if you're trying to hire a new team member, it comes down to, can I steal them from somewhere else they're already happily working, right, and lure them away, which is you know, sometimes what you have to do if there's no other people available. So it does feel to me like a shortage. On top of that, is that shortage taking an effect on us? 59% uh, of people said moderate to extreme risk because of their lack of staff. And so yes, at least perceptively, this does seem to be a big problem. And so this conversation is about how to keep people that you have hired uh, in their seat and enjoying and keeping them in the lifelong career. Now, what is the average for someone doing this type of work? There was an HP study that said one to three years is the average time an analyst stays in their role, which seems like a very short time to me. Uh, we go to school, we do you know, a bunch of expensive programs and training, and then to stay in the job for one to three years seems like a big investment up front for something you might quickly think you don't like. And I think that a lot of people just realize that maybe it's the place they're working or whatever it is, they don't like it and they switch around. But how do we keep those people so that this doesn't happen to us and our own organizations, right? I went looking for some, I don't know if testimonials is the word, but uh, comments on SOC work. So I went to Reddit and I went to Ask NetSec, which is one of the sections for asking people in cybersecurity. And these were the comments that I found about any time someone was talking about a SOC job, which was very disappointing to me. Because I see a lot of stuff on here that's like, oh, we're just making metrics, I'm drowning in tickets. Uh, we get alerts like you're, uh, you were scanned by an IP that was command and control 10 years ago. Uh, something must be compromised. It's really boring, you know, things like that. This is not what I want to see from this job, right? There's a lot of people out there, especially at the entry level coming in, and we don't want to put them in this sort of role. And so I feel like my uh, skill and my experience uh, can help out the situation. And so that's why I wanted to do this and point out the things that I think separate people that have this sort of a feeling about their SOC job from folks who really enjoy the job, because they are out there, and I've talked to a lot of them. So uh, what are the differences in those kind of uh, situations? <coughs> so burnout is typically the word that gets thrown around when you end up with people who are you know, cyni uh, cynical and, and things like that. 
uh, making the comments that we just saw. Uh, diminished interest in work and exhaustion and all of this. We've seen this probably in coworkers, right? But where does this come from? Uh, we have some general reasons where burnout from work comes from. Uh, some of the main ones are like lack of control or working in a very dysfunctional team, uh, poor work life imbalance, and all of those things can of course affect SOC uh, analysts. But there's some specific things that have been found by some uh, research specific to the job role that I thought were really interesting. And so the idea here is if we can find the causes of burnout, not only in general, but also in specific to the job role, then we can start to fight it and then hopefully uh, remove ourselves from the cycle of constantly having to hire people and dealing with turnover and having a bunch of miserable employees or being a miserable employee ourselves. If we know what makes our own job better, we can suggest to management how to fix it. So you will leave this conversation today with the knowledge of how to do that. If we can do this better, everyone wins, right? The SOC analyst wins because they're happier, management's happier because they're not hiring people, and the business is happier because the longer those people stay, the better they get at their job. They learn the network, they learn the people, they you know open lines of communication, and we want them there for the long haul. So we're trying to cultivate a team that is intrinsically motivated. Uh, you know, trusts each other, happy, jumps out of bed in the morning, excited to go to work, right? Uh, that's a tricky thing to cultivate. And so if you think about how we've done this in the past, Generally, if you would say, well, what's going to make the people on my team happy? A lot of people will bounce to money. And they're like, oh, am I paying them enough, right? Because people always want more money. Of course, that's always going to be how it is. But is this going to be the thing that rescues you from an unhappy team versus a happy team? Probably not. Uh, there's some research on the next slide that will talk about this in specific. But I'm sure we've all got a raise at some point in our life. And it was great that day. And maybe we went and bought ourselves something nice. But three weeks later, did that make you love your job if you didn't love your job before? No, right? It just became the new normal. And so there is some research uh, that Daniel Pink was discussing in his book from a few years ago called Drive. And this is a book looking for ways to engage and motivate knowledge workers, right? And so one of the things he points out in this book is if you have a purely mechanical, repetitive job and you're on an assembly line or something like that, more money can, in fact, have good consequences for just paying people more, they can do a better job. However, when it comes to stuff that is trickier and it's more knowledge work and heuristic kind of based, uh, it does not work. And in fact, it can even hurt. And so what they were saying is if you pay people too much, it can start to become about the money and external motivators as opposed to the internal uh, satisfaction you have with solving problems and, and you know, the other things that would draw you to that in the first place. And so uh, it is you know, something that he says is probably not the right approach. And so we have to figure out what is it that will inspire people in these type of jobs. And if anyone's read this, there was three factors that he identified. And these line up very well with the specific things that I'm going to talk about afterwards to a sock. But this stuff, it'll be fairly self-obvious, right? I'll say these things, you're like, yeah, that totally makes sense. But if you don't have a label or a model to kind of put these together and remember them in your mind, it's kind of hard to come up with, you know, oh, I'm unhappy here, but I don't really know why. Like, how could I tweak things to make it better? So we'll list off this stuff and talk about how it uh, kind of works together. And so hopefully uh, you'll leave with um, a good idea of how to, to make your job more enjoyable. So autonomy is the first one, the desire to be self-directed, as he stated. Uh, people obviously love being self-directed. You want to do what you want to do and not what someone else wants you to do, right? That's a fairly obvious one. And so the more degree of autonomy you have, the more likely you are to be happy with your job and uh, more engaged and excited to be there. That would make sense. The second one identified by Daniel Pink was mastery, the drive to get better at something. So this is another fairly obvious one, especially in tech and, and other things like that. We're a bunch of people who generally are very intellectually curious. Uh, we're going home and we're coding stuff, putting it on GitHub, giving ourselves challenges. You know, in general, people like to be challenged and feel like they're getting better at something. And so that's why we do a lot of those things, right? And we want to have a job that continues to feel like it is building us up and we're getting better and better over the years. This can fall afoul of some sock jobs because if you have a repetitive job, you may feel like you've hit the ceiling and you aren't mastering stuff, right? The other high level principle is purpose. And purpose comes in at a few levels. Uh, there is kind of the macro level of do I agree with my company and what we're doing and what we're trying to take the world with our product or whatever it is that we make. And then there's the more micro level on maybe the security team specifically. Do I feel like what I'm doing here is actually contributing to meaningful security changes in the company? Or am I just doing things and you know, allowing someone to check a box, but ultimately we're not accomplishing anything here? Uh, people, of course, want to feel like what they're doing makes a difference. And so they want to be aligned with what the company's doing. They want to know that what they're doing is actually saving people from getting infected and viruses being stopped and all that sort of stuff. 
So those three things at the high level, what keeps people uh, in <clears throat> like knowledge work sort of jobs engaged and motivated? Does this translate to a SOC? So I was looking for the answer to this question and I stumbled upon the perfect paper on this and they found the answer was yes. So there is an academic paper out there and it's cited on the bottom and I'll, I'll bring up a, the full version of it after so if you want to take a screenshot of the, the full title. Uh, this was a group of researchers from Kansas State University and they were trying to figure out what causes burnout specifically in a security operations center. And so the approach they first took was let's just go interview people and try to find the answer. And they found when they did that, there was a lot of mistrust. And so um, <clears throat> they would go and talk to people and they're like, eh, I don't really know where this information is going to end up. And they just kind of gave them vague and general answers and they didn't really get any meaningful results out of it. So they said, okay, uh, we need a new approach. So they went with the anthropological method, which is kind of what you do when you run into a group of distrusting individuals. When you want to get real answers, you have to become one of them. So they used the same method you would use if you were going to study you know, a tribe somewhere that had never contacted modern society. You have to send someone there, they have to become you know, integrated with the group, get, build trust and, and learn what they're doing. And so SOCs kind of being secretive and all that sort of stuff kind of led to that same situation. So they actually took someone and they put them in the SOC and made them a SOC analyst for six months. And so they did the job, they learned what the ups and downs were and they also interviewed people along the way and took a bunch of process notes. And so when they did that, they were able to come up with a model from what they found. Uh, there's a, a technique called grounded theory that can turn what their observations were into an actual uh, kind of process model and identify themes and concepts that were causing the problem. So that's what this paper was all about. And I found this thing and I'm like, oh man, this is you know, super exciting. I think this is the reason that explains why I didn't hate my SOC job, but a lot of people in other companies seem to in some cases. You know, what are the common factors there? And so what they came up with was a human capital model for mitigating security analyst burnout. That was the, the name of the paper. And human capital in this sense uh, refers to, it's, a, it's an idea by Adam Smith and from the Wealth of Nations and all of that, uh, that talks about the kind of collective skill and knowledge and capabilities of a group of people in a certain situation. So in this case, the human capital of the SOC is all of the training and all of the talent and skill that goes into everyone that encompasses that SOC. So they came up with what they called the uh, human capital model <coughs> here. And this is just part of the model. We're going to build on this in a second after I step through these things. So growth, skills, empowerment, and creativity. And they found that this here was a positive feedback loop. And by that, I mean in the control theory sense, not in the, oh, it's all great kind of sense, right? Whatever happens to one of these, the next thing is going to go in the same direction. It's like a snowball rolling downhill, right? You push one of these down, and the rest of them are going to follow and spiral into something that is bad, or you can lift them up and create a virtuous cycle, which is why it's the name of this talk. So, <clears throat> some detail on each of these things. They say, uh, burnout is a human capital management problem. And so the core thing to stop burnout is to address these specific items. And these kind of apply to all jobs, uh, but specifically they were researching SOC analysts. So it's the most relevant here in this case, but you'll probably find the same thing for your own job if you're not working in SOC. So skills. Skills is the first one, and this is skills to actually do the job. In security, you may feel great about what you know right now, but what about in a month or a year from now? Things change drastically, right? So you need constant training. Uh, no one got into information security because they wanted to learn something that they learned in, you know, learn something in school and then never learn anything again. You're going to fail if that's your approach to information security. All the news has to be brought in every day and you have to consider what does this change in my situation and all of that. So training is super important. Uh, and if people don't have training, they're not going to be confident. Uh, low confidence breeds frustration and anxiety and ultimately leads to burnout. So we need to make sure people feel like they have the skills and they have the training to keep those up to date. Empowerment is another one. So empowerment to perform your job efficiently, get to the data you need to get to and actually have the power to affect change and stop bad things from happening. Uh, some of the things they suggest for this was allowing analysts to author new threat detections. So if they see things going wrong, they probably know how to pick it up. So they let them you know, write rules to uh, stop those things or at least identify them. Developing their own tools is needed. Uh, if you have an analyst that says, I hate this part of my job and I know how to fix it, give them the time to fix it, right? Uh, and then make sure they see the impact of what they are doing. Now how this ties in, in a positive feedback loop to the previous thing, if you are training your people and they have you know, current knowledge and they're highly skilled, 
then you're probably going to trust them with the powers to do whatever it is they need to do. If you do not train them, then you're going to have the perception that, you know, as a manager, like, ah, I don't know if I can trust them with the ability to be an admin on this system, or if I can trust them to go in and collect such and such data. So you need to have people that you trust with skills to enable them to be empowered, right? Uh, they're kind of connected pretty closely in that regard. Another one is creativity, and this is the freedom and the ability to take on new scenarios in novel ways. This has some interesting tie-ins with playbooks that I'll get to later, but when something new pops up, do the analysts on the team have a certain set of options that they can pick from and that's it? Or are they allowed to kind of go off the rails and, and explore new alternatives and new options for solving problems in different ways? Uh, we want to have the analysts that are empowered to do that, and if they're empowered to do so, that's going to lead to an increase in creativity. So this is another really important one. We want to encourage people to learn new technologies, learn new tools, uh, and kind of step outside their pure operation tasks and make themselves better, kind of as a side task. And that, of course, leads to growth. So if your analysts are able to be creative and are empowered to do so, uh, they're obviously going to keep growing. And so growth in this case, uh, increase in intellectual capacity and capabilities of the analysts is how they phrase this. Uh, there's a number of ways that you can learn, right, and, and grow. Learning on the job is a big one, learning from mentors, formal, uh, going, uh, formal training, going to conferences and everything like that. These are all super important and obviously feed right back into the skills piece. The more you're growing, the more skills you're going to pick up, the more empowerment you're going to have, and then you're going to be able to be more creative and come up with better solutions. So it is a positive feedback loop of all of those things spinning. But there's more to it than that. There are a few additional factors that they found. Uh, that was the core like four categories that, if anything else, tune your processes and what you're doing to optimize those four things. But outside of that, uh, to mitigate analyst burnout, SOX have to pay special attention to the interaction of human capital with three other factors. Uh, that's what the paper said. And so what are those three factors? They're kind of more technology and management centric. The first one, which probably won't surprise you, is automation, right? This is a big topic right now in security. Anyone here go to Black Hat? How many times did you see the word automation, right? It's all over the place. <laughs> SOAR tools are the new hotness. Uh, security, orchestration, automation, and response. And so what is a SOAR tool? It's a way to lower the bar and make it very easy for any team to script things and integrate them together to automate stuff, which is great. Uh, if you ha have the ability to automate stuff very easily, you can eliminate those repetitive tasks that are very low creativity tasks that no one likes doing in the first place. So this is an enabler of creativity because it removes other work that there's no value in humans doing, but maybe you didn't have the ability to automate it before. SOAR comes in and it prepackages a bunch of scripts and everything for you and you can throw them on a GUI and kind of connect them with if and then and else kind of blocks and conditional logic. So automation is a great thing. However, to get to the point where you need to be with automation, uh, you need to give your analyst time for reflection. And so we have to say it is okay to take some time out, think about, uh, and you want to empower and incentivize your analyst to do this, how you can make your own job better. Think about every single step that you take day to day. And is there value in you moving that bit of data here or performing this interaction? Or can we just make an API call and have it all happen automatically? That's the promise of SOAR tools, right? is humans are only doing the work that humans should be doing and everything else is scripted and automated together. So only the interesting work is left. And that, of course, feeds the human capital thing, right? Because we're now we're doing work we like instead of repetitive work feeling like robots. So we need to have time, right? And this is a big uh, issue. You hear all the time, oh, if I only had time to do this, I could make it better, right? That's a common problem. If you have automation, this will inherently bring operational efficiency. Just having people that are on the positive you know, uh, side of the human capital model will inherently bring operational efficiency. But automation tools are a force multiplier on that. And so uh, this is a really important one to have, uh, and automation is kind of what brings this about. The last piece of this model is metrics. And I have on the next slide how these all relate to each other within that uh, cycle. Metrics are the communication channel between the SOC and management. And that is a very, very important thing to remember. Because all of the funding and all of the backing for the SOC and the reason it exists is because management wants it to exist. It's a loss prevention function and it's not a cheap one, right? And so the SOC has to continually justify that it, why it exists and that it should exist. And so the metrics you're creating are inherently going to be brought up if you are working more efficiently and people are happy. Um, if they're, you know, on the downside, metrics are going to look bad, management's going to see bad metrics and start getting, you know, the idea in their head that the SOC is not worth what we're paying them. 
And so ultimately funding is going to go down and then you're not going to get any training. And then now we turn this into a vicious cycle and things go south rather quickly. So you can see how this stuff would be all connected, right? And so uh, this is the whole model here. And in the paper, they have a slightly more detailed one. I made, I cut out a few boxes, but I, I mentioned how it all connects just to make it fit on the slide. Here on this side is the human capital kind of four uh, concepts that we need to optimize for and bringing those about along with automation tools will bring operational efficiency. Operational efficiency leads to good metrics. Good metrics fed to management means happy management, which means the SOC continues to exist and do what they do and get training and funding. And all of this is one big positive uh, feedback loop as well. Not just this, but all the way through this path as well. So these are the things that we have to try to optimize for, whether you're in a SOC or not, right? You can see how these things would make people happy and how ultimately the metrics you create are an output of what you're doing and then we'll fund a feedback loop to whether you get funded to keep doing it or not. So that is the whole model and what we want to optimize for. So given that, take some moment to reflect here, whether you're in a SOC or whether you're doing a different job. Are you aiming for these values or are we controlling people and putting limits on them and kind of stifling their creativity or taking away their empowerment? Uh, are we constantly feeding new skills to the people that want to work for us? A lot of people in information security are hungry to just learn as fast as possible. And getting in the way of that is a great way to make people leave. And so that is a really important thing. So before you answer that, uh, here's some uh, questions to think of on this track. As an analyst, we have playbooks. That's become a big thing, especially with SOAR tools. You make this workflow of here's an input, here's this and this and this and this happens. Some of it's automated, some of it's manual interaction. Uh, and the, all these things need to occur. And maybe we have a phishing email, you follow this set of steps. You get a USB virus, you follow this set of steps. Things like that. Do the analysts know what to do when a situation arises that is not in the playbook? Are they empowered to do something outside of the playbook? Or even within the playbook, how much leverage do they have, right? This gets back to the whole autonomy thing and creativity specifically in the human capital model. Uh, are they comfortable off the map? If you find that people don't know what to do when there isn't a prescribed set of steps, you probably have an issue with creativity. Or if you're purposefully saying, in this role you can't do more than X, then you're probably also limiting creativity and that could be a dangerous thing to do. Are analysts trusted by management? Can they get to the endpoints? Can they see the data they need to see? Uh, when I was uh, fairly new to being an analyst, we had a situation where there was like proxy log data and they were like, hey security team, you can't see the proxy log data because you know it's covered by privacy rules and you're gonna have to ask permission if you have to see proxy logs. So of course, we heard that and we're like, you realize we need this for nearly every single thing we do because if we're trying to find if someone's infected, they're probably going to be making some kind of HTTP transaction. That goes through the proxy, we need the proxy logs. And they're like, yeah, just ask permission. All right, we're gonna have to ask like 10 times a day. And so we started doing that and eventually that broke down and we're like, look, we just need like blanket permission to do this because it's insane to ask every single time to do our job, right? That's just red tape that doesn't need to be there. And so that kind of thing can pop up. So yes, we want to be on a uh, you know, least privilege kind of, uh, you know, that's a good security principle, right? Least privilege and access to data. But if you're getting in the way of something that your analysts need literally every single time or would greatly improve the quality of their analysis, try to remove that roadblock, right? <clears throat> Our process is needlessly manual. There's a lot of times that I'll you know, be talking to people and they say, oh, we do such and such and move data here to there. Uh, we were guilty of this at one point. Uh, early on, we uh, had a bunch of alerts for everything that went off going into an email inbox, and it was kind of our you know, cue for what was going on. So when we validated something and said, oh, we want to investigate this alert, we would take the text out of the email and then paste it into the incident response ticket solution, right? That is a big waste of time. Why are we manually moving text from one thing to the other and refilling in boxes? If we could just automate that and have our alerts go directly to the ticketing solution and then triage them there, we're not re-entering data and we're saving a bunch of time. So just stuff like that, right? Think about your workflow and does it make sense for you to be doing the steps that you're doing? Uh, try to get rid of that stuff and SOAR tools really make that easy to do. Training, this is a constant uh, topic between a lot of analysts and management. Uh, analysts typically want to learn very, very quickly, but doing so requires either you know, expensive classes or travel, and there's always this kind of back and forth about what can we afford versus what they want. 
Uh, obviously, more training is going to be better in a lot of cases. Uh, live fire practice, we'll get to like purple teaming and stuff on a, on a later slide, but how often are people getting trained? Some analysts work in places where they're like, they're just not going to pay for training for us, and so they end up paying for it themselves. You can probably imagine what road that leads down for those people. They want to probably work somewhere else that does provide training, because there's plenty of places out there that do provide training. And I get it, right? It can be expensive, but there are alternatives and other ways that you can hopefully facilitate that if you don't have budget uh, for a, a you know, high cost training package. Another key thing to think about here, who trains your most advanced people? If people want to constantly learn, and we're taking that as an assumption here, what happens when they get to the top of the organization, your best analyst, right? Along the way, they probably had mentors, they were learning from their coworkers, and maybe they got some formal training as well. But when they get to the top, now they've found the ceiling, and they're gonna start looking around and thinking like, I don't know if I have anything more to learn here, right? And so if you want to keep those people, and you do because they're your best, right? Those are the ones you might need to fund the formal training for in some way uh, as the most high priority because you want to keep them learning and make sure they don't feel like they've found the ceiling and get bored with their job. And so that's a really important one there as well. Do analysts get free time for new ideas and tools? Uh, this is one of the other problems I commonly heard. There was someone in the audience yesterday when I gave this talk that was talking about we don't have any free time outside of the tickets that we have to do. So if you don't have any free time, you're always operationally clicking through stuff, you're never going to have time to make your job better. So you have to give people that time to pursue what they know is going to make, in the long term, their job more pleasant and more likely ultimately to stay. Uh, we all heard of probably Google's 20% time and things like that, right? Initiatives where you say, hey employees, do whatever it is that you have come up with because we know you have good ideas and here's some time to take off from your normal work to do that. Uh, that's a really important thing to do. They need to do this in a distraction-free way. If you give them a day to do this and then you cut it up with meetings every half an hour, do you think they're going to be productive at doing that thing? Of course not, right? So my suggestion to you on this one is make sure they have that time to get into the flow state or deep work or whatever you want to call it. There's been a lot of books on that uh, and the benefits of that recently. Maybe let them work from home that day and exempt them from all meetings, right? Let them focus on the task and not have to worry about everything else. Uh, encourage that. Maybe turn off you know, IMs or whatever it takes. And then finally, uh, for this talk specifically, how does your tier one feel? And tier one, if you're not familiar with SOCs, is generally you know, the entry level. Uh, and in a traditional kind of tiered SOC, it would be triage and alert, decide if it's something that needs to be looked at closer, and then maybe pitch it up to tier two. Now that job, you can imagine, gets boring fairly quickly because you are inherently limited. And so we're saying you can see this data, but then once you identify that something's bad, hand it off, right? And then go to the next one. That's interesting for a little bit, but not that long. And so traditional tiered socks have traditionally put artificial limits on people. And so when I read that paper and I saw how all those things interact, I came to the conclusion, which I think is probably a, a not as popular one because a lot of people have a tiered sock, that I feel like tiered socks are engineered in a way that's going to drive people to eventually want to leave if you are placing artificial limits on them, right? Which is why, and I think what ultimately answered my question, in my job we ran a tierless sock and those are out there, right? It wasn't just us. Tierless socks are kind of run in a way where everyone can do what they think they're capable of doing. They have to know their limits, they have to ask for help, but we're not going to say, oh, this is a really hard ticket, you can't do that, right? You can maybe own the thing from front to back and where you run out of the ability to act and then you pass it to someone else and then have them teach you how to do it. That optimizes for constant learning. And if you're constantly learning, you're constantly building your skills, your creativity, you're empowered to do that sort of stuff, it's going to lead to a place where people like to work. And I've heard that over and over from socks that were similar to the way that we ran ours, uh, having the same experience. And so that's where I started to come up with you know, the theory here that I think tearless socks may ultimately uh, trade long-term success for short-term control, the very rigid process, and being able to say, oh, tier one does this, tier two does that. And so uh, that's what kind of uh, brought this whole presentation about. So how does your tier one feel, right? Uh, do they feel like they're standing on the ground floor looking up through a glass ceiling at a bunch of interesting stuff they can't do? Or do they feel like they're on a rocket ship, right? Learning everything as fast as they can, soaking in all the data. That's how you want them to feel. And if you have them feeling uh, like on the right side there, they're probably gonna stick around. So how do we architect our SOC and, and what are some recommendations for this? My first one here is for skill improvement. Uh, they say focus on diverse and frequent training of multiple types. How I would implement this, and that, that's a phrase out of the paper. My uh, interpretation of how to do this in a very effective way, one of my favorite things is purple teaming. 
uh, purple teaming in this respect, how we did it at GSK. We would have pen testers come in and they would sit at a table with us, the blue team, and we would run through a whole bunch of attack types, all from the same stage of the kill chain. And we kind of walk through the whole kill chain. So we would take like delivery stage, for example, and we would say, all right, how are all the ways that we may deliver some kind of attack? Through email. How can we do it through email? We could send an executable, send a zip file, send a JavaScript, send a macro and a Word document, uh, send a malicious link or whatever. Uh, try all of those things and record them in a tool to say, was it totally missed, was it detected, or was it blocked? And then kind of come up with the outcome for each stage of the kill chain. And so when you do that, not only do you get an awesome list of what works against your company in an attack, but you also have the blue team learning very, very quickly and effectively what a real attack looks like on the network and how to find it in your own tools. And that is an incredibly important thing to do. We can send them out to classes and they can learn this uh, you know, hands-on with the tools that are used for the class, but the absolute best training is going to be on your network with your tools. And so I can't say enough positive stuff about purple teaming, both in terms of the management side of tracking progress over time, because the idea is you do this once a quarter or something like that. And there are tools out there and then I can talk about if anyone's interested specifically in what it is to help you uh, track that as an objective measure of the blue team over time. Uh, as a training, it helps work really, really well. So train like you fight is kind of the phrase that goes with this. We want to see as closest to the real thing as possible so that when we do see the real thing, we know that we will catch it. <clears throat> Second one, analyst empowerment. Make sure analysts can challenge themselves. Uh, I already kind of said, if you push artificial limits on people, they're going to quickly get bored and quickly want to leave. So avoid that at all costs and make sure that they are still constantly learning, whether it's formal training or whether it's on the job. Keep them not being able to find that ceiling, right? That's an important thing. Your people should never find the ceiling because that's when they start to look other places for jobs. So no arbitrary limits. Um, and you know, having them work somewhat autonomously is going to lead to more engagement. Creativity. So I said provide a time for a creative outlet. Uh, this is a struggle for a lot of companies and for a lot of people, both in a SOC and out of a SOC. Uh, there is a concept called the Eisenhower matrix, and it's part of uh, the Franklin Covey Four Disciplines of Execution and other various things like that. Uh, basically, the suggestion is look at your to-do list on two different axes, on what is urgent and what is important. And if you think about those two as different things, right, there's a lot of stuff that is urgent and important. There's stuff that's important but not urgent, and then there's stuff that's not important but urgent. And so if you're thinking about what a SOC is doing day to day, there are tasks like creating automation, creating tools to make your job better, that fall under the not urgent, but very, very important box, right? It's called box two, it's a, it's a you know, two by two box. Um, then there's the alerts that you see coming in day to day, right? Is the average alert truly important? Like more important than improving your long-term capability to uh, like act efficiently? Probably not, but it feels important because it's in a list of things on a dashboard that's blinking at you in red, right? Now I would argue, unless you're under targeted attack or something very drastic is happening at that particular moment, your time is probably better spent developing automation than it is you know, just triaging individual tickets that aren't all that exciting. And so I would say in, in at least many cases, what you're thinking is urgent and important is actually just urgent and not really that important compared to other stuff you could be doing. But it feels that way. And so people get stuck in this whirlwind of, you know, oh, I need to do tickets and tickets and tickets. But that pile never ends, right? You're never gonna get to the bottom of that list. And so you never do the automation, and so this stuff never happens, and then ultimately you work in a place that never improves, and you get tired with it and you leave. So that's a really good way to think of stuff. And I've even run my personal to-do list like this, right? I have everything listed out as like, what is really important and urgent? And that's like house fires and stuff that's really, really bad, right? Most things are not truly important and truly urgent. Uh, so focusing on that stuff that's important but doesn't seem urgent, that's how you win and get ahead very quickly. You just have to get over the mental hurdle of what feels important but is actually not. Growth, optimize for Goldilocks tasks. So this is putting people at the edge of their comfort zone, not above it because that causes anxiety and people freak out because they don't feel like they know what they're doing, but not below it because people get bored very quickly. So finding where this is for individuals is going to be a lot about talking to them and having one-on-one -on -one conversations and saying, what are you doing? Uh, do you like doing it? What are you very comfortable doing? And trying to steer them constantly to something that is at the edge of their ability. People have probably heard of the 10,000 hour rule of mastery. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell talks a lot about that. Uh, and I can't remember which book it is. Um, yeah, and, uh, and 
there is a different book called Peak by Anders Ericsson. And in that book, Anders Ericsson is actually the person that did the research that Malcolm Gladwell came to those conclusions based on. And Anders Ericsson says, actually, Malcolm Gladwell got it wrong. It's not really about 10,000 hours being magic. What it's actually about is the time of deliberate practice that you put into learning something. And the more you're falling into this deliberate practice kind of zone, the faster you will become, uh, you will master whatever given topic it is. And so for deliberate practice, this is where he says focus sessions, uh, very clear like ways to benchmark yourself and understand how you did in that session, and then pushing people outside their comfort zone and kind of working on that edge of your capability constantly is what really truly leads to rapid improvements in skill. And 10,000 hours just tended to be what it seemed like a lot of people took to do this. Well, you can accelerate it. So it's not necessarily time bound. It's about deliberate practice. And so when you say, here, take a creative project, do this as best you can, take you know, focused time at home alone with IMs turned off. Right? That can be a great deliberate practice session and can give people the ability to uh, build a lot of skills very rapidly. So those are the tasks we want to uh, optimize for and make sure you understand where people fall and assign them those kind of things. Automation and operational efficiency. SOAR tools, do you need one to create automation? Absolutely not, right? A lot of teams out there can uh, script. If you know PowerShell, if you know Python, if you know bash scripting, you can do what a SOAR tool is doing. You just have to write it yourself. But people have been doing this forever, right? It's just called scripting. SOAR just put a front end that has a GUI with it, right? So whether you have a SOAR tool or not, this can be done. If you don't have a SOAR tool, then it may take you a little longer and you may need people with more capability, but you can get it done. And with that automation, you want to eliminate those repetitive tasks like the play. Just get rid of everything that you can possibly get rid of that is not fun to do. Think about what it will take to do that sort of stuff. Sometimes it's tricky and you have to think about like, one of the things we did was triaging all the email that people reported as spam. Well, how do we go through a giant inbox of email and then pull out the stuff and investigate the things we're interested in? You kind of have to think about your workflow. So what did we do? We said, okay, we're going to use PowerShell, pull all the emails out of Outlook, and then we're going to parse through them in JSON format and look for URLs and then can collect those URLs and do a bunch of you know, submissions to thread and tell and all that stuff and take a lot of the work out, right? It can take, be multiple steps to do this, but you can get a lot done with automation, even if it's not a single one step uh, task. So giving uh, time for doing that and giving your analysts uh, the ability to do that is another creative outlet and they will continue to learn and it's great for everyone. Metrics is a big topic, and I won't go too far into it here, but here are some of the key, I don't know, meta features that I would say that I, I want to see in what you're reporting as metrics. First of all, talk to your analysts. Do they buy into what you're reporting? Do they think it is reflective of reality, or are you reporting stuff that is just fluff and we're just doing it so that we say we produce metrics, right? Uh, make sure that they feel fairly judged, because if they don't feel fairly judged, they're going to be doing stuff to try to make the metrics good, which is not what you want them doing, right? Do they demonstrate a SOC ROI? Uh, not just the ROI, but are they reflective of the analyst effort? Um, analyst effort is here because there's a lot of tasks that SOC can do that aren't directly stopping attacks. Getting better is something you want to happen. So that kind of effort to either uh, create new tools should be reported on, or when you're investigating stuff, but it ends up as a false positive. Is that wasted work? Not really, because you still have to investigate a lot of things. You want to eliminate false positives as much as possible, but we're never going to get to zero. And so that time spent on triaging false positive alerts is not wasted, so you want to say, even if there's nothing in the report of bad things that happened this month, look, we still got a lot of things done, we made these improvements, we spent this much time uh, looking through potential issues, we just didn't find any this month. And so we don't want management saying, hey, there were no attacks this month, what are we paying for, right? That's the kind of thing we're trying to prevent. Does behavior drive metrics or do metrics drive behavior? If you have the wrong metrics or if you just have metrics that are too strictly enforced, I've heard of this one as well. People do things and they change their workflow and how they report stuff because they know that they are being harshly judged on their metrics. So if you have a situation where you're looking for people to close more tickets than other people, right? If, you're, if one of your metrics is how many tickets did that analyst close compared to their peers? Do you want them to drive that number high? Is it good to close the most tickets? Not necessarily, right? Because how can you gain that metric? You just don't look at stuff very close. You're like, ah, it's fine, right? Great, now you have the highest number of tickets closed and you're the most efficient analyst, but you're also the worst one because you're not looking at anything. So be very careful with some of those things. <clears throat> and then do you understand the right levers you're going to pull to change those metrics? Uh, there's a lot of bad metrics that I've seen over the years. One of the ones I hate the most is how many attacks did you stop? 
And so I can get into the argument with that real easily, right? What is an attack? Is me responding and, and going into a machine and cleaning it out an attack? Yeah, probably, because there was a virus and we had to do manual effort, that's an easy one. But what about backing it all the way up? Is a probe on the outside of the firewall an attack, right? Is a firewall deny an attack? Maybe. It was the first stage of one, right? Someone was trying to connect to something that shouldn't be there and, and doesn't make any sense to be doing. So yeah, technically it's an attack. It's just the very, very first stage that doesn't really mean anything. So do you want me to report the one billion firewall denies that we had? Or do you want me to report how many viruses we had or how many proxy blocks that we had, right? I can play with that number. And then if I do report that number, what level or, lever are you going to pull to try to change how many attacks we're receiving a month, right? There's nothing you can do about that. It's a number that just happens, and so it's not a very good metric. So think about that stuff. Uh, the other one that I run into is a lot of teams are, you know, have a runaway ticket queue that they can't keep on top of. And so they're reporting the ticket queue, and then it goes up and up and up, and ultimately management is like, why can't you keep on top of tickets? Do you not have enough people? And a lot of times the answer is, yeah, I need more people. But is that really what you need, right? What is the root of the problem of there's too many bad things happening in the environment? You don't have enough blocks to stop those things from happening, right? So if you could put in a better spam filter or more aggressive proxy blocks or whitelist applications from running, if everyone can download everything from all over the internet and run it on your organization's computers, you're going to have a lot of tickets and that's the problem. It's not that you have too many tickets, right? So consider what the root of the problem is to try to steer some of these things down uh, that you are uh, collecting as well. And then finally, uh, on the topic of human capital, running a human's first SOC. So what I mean by that is optimizing the processes, the learning, the training, the mentoring, and all of that for people loving their job. And if you do that, then good security should emerge by nature because people will like what they're doing, they'll be very good at it, they'll stay around, they'll know the organization and the risks and the threats, and they will understand it and they will become very, very good at it. And so if we optimize for people loving their job, ultimately we're going to get those that stay around and become very awesome at doing it uh, as a result. And so we want to, uh, I want to push that as a primary goal, cultivating human capital and then letting the good security emerge from that, right? <clears throat> and so that's where I think uh, having a tiered SOC versus a tierless SOC Yes, a tiered SOC may be able to say we have very strict processes and everyone clicks this box and then this box and this box. And that's great in the short term, but if we want to long term win, right? If we let the reins loose a little bit, let people learn and do what they want to do, we're probably actually going to get better security in the end. Even though it feels a little more chaotic uh, in the beginning, you will probably get better security about it. So. Uh, that was kind of the thesis of this presentation, and, and hopefully uh, you agree with that. Uh, I'd love to hear feedback on that after the fact, so I'll be hanging out here. And if you work for a SOC uh, in any kind of capacity, I'd love to, to hear your thoughts on that. So uh, that's kind of the idea there, and that brings me to the end of the presentation. So I have this uh, kind of stuff written into my new course. Uh, that's it down there, Sec450 Blue Team Fundamentals. And so uh, if you're interested, there's a, a much larger section in that class on this, and I'm easily findable online. Uh, Twitter, SecHub, uh, LinkedIn is John L. Hubbard, and then that's my email address there. So if you want to get a hold of me uh, for any reason, I'm easy to contact. So uh, any questions? Yes? So when I got into this industry two decades ago, everything was very ad hoc. Mm -hmm. We were all creative. We were all autonomous. That's how we solved problems. Mm -hmm. Then a few years into it, someone came along with this great idea that we need to standardize. We need to document our processes and our procedures step by step. Yep. So all these big components of a framework. Uh -huh. And then you can kind of come out and in your implementation, you kind of conflict with a paradigm that we're currently operating on. Yes. So how do you rationalize doing this in the current paradigm that we've been living in for 15 plus years of, you got to be standardized, it's got to be step by step by step, you do not go off script because this is how we're going to be the hackers. Yeah, so what I'm advocating for here is not total chaos and a return to completely ad hoc. What I'm saying, though, is there is a happy middle ground between too restrictive and total chaos. And so maybe backing up a little bit from 100% prescribed activity will ultimately lead to longer term wins. And uh, this is you know, a very common thing when it comes to playbooks, right? If you've ever tried to uh, come up with a set of playbooks for everything that your SOC might encounter, you crash into this problem. Because how closely do you want to make playbooks, right? People say, oh, I want to have a playbook for every single situation. And then they realize enumerating that many things is just absolutely impossible. And the nuance of each type of situation is just different that you can try to do that and go all the way with it, but you'll quickly find it doesn't work. And so in that kind of situation, the same thing applies. You have to back up a little bit and just kind of say like, here's the fishing playbook. And then you say like, check these things and kind of accept that you're never going to have every single 
possible permutation of an attack accounted for and kind of let loose a little bit on that. And so it's the same thing with some of these, right? Uh, we can try to be very prescriptive, but it becomes too restricting and people don't really like it. So uh, I'm not advocating for all the way, just kind of like one step back, maybe two steps back from where we were in terms of trying to keep people around and then ultimately get better at it. Yes? Any comments about, uh, like say one scenario you mentioned, a tier list type sock, and another one would be say if you outsource your tier one, mm -hmm. and then just say you have tier two and three, I mean, yeah. I mean they're, they're pretty close, I would think, in my mind. I don't know. I think it's kind of callous to say it's somebody else's problem with the outsource side, but it is. But. Well, so, it's someone else's problem to manage this, but yeah. those people are in charge of your security, and also you're not outsourcing responsibility for being hacked, right? But so, the <laughs> so if it's not up to snuff, you can get rid of it. Yeah, else. exactly. And so we had this discussion actually yesterday too. Is if you're getting an MSSP, right? Maybe dig into this and say like, what is your retention on average for analysts? Like, can I talk to some of them and can I see how they feel, you know, about the processes and things like that? And trying to push into that would be a, a advisable thing to do, I would say, for, for picking an MSSP because I've you know taught a lot of classes around the world and talked to a lot of people that both work for MSSPs or have MSSPs and uh, there is a pretty kind of bipolar distribution on feelings for MSSPs, right? There's some really bad ones, there's some really good ones. I've talked to people that work at MSSPs, literally in Singapore, I had a conversation with a student that was like, yeah, I work for an MSSP, but I don't think we really know what we're doing. I get alerts, I don't know what I'm doing. I pass them up and to someone else that doesn't know what they're doing, and then ultimately we let it sit there and we close the ticket. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> so <laughs> that's out there. <laughs> so be very careful with your MSSP. <laughs> so having said that, are we pretty close to letting Watson take it for tier one or something like that? But There's another, yeah, big discussion of are we going to completely automate away tier one, right? And my opinion on that is no, because there's still a lot of judgment and things that machine learning and AI is not ready to do. That being said, a lot of the painful stuff that tier one traditionally did, like shuffling data around and escalating stuff, that can now be automated. So I don't think tier one is going to go away. We're always going to need entry level people, but what they do is probably going to become a lot better and more interesting and hopefully wider scope, right? If, if people go towards this model. Does SOAR help with automating this tool? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, SOAR is definitely the tool that, that is going to implement most of this stuff. Yep. Demisto, Phantom, uh, DF Labs, Simplify, like all those tools are now popping up for this kind of stuff. Yeah, Swimlane, yeah, yeah, yep. You mentioned Swimlane, they're a Colorado company. Yeah, Swimlane. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, there's, there's a bunch of them out there. So all of that stuff is available, you know, and, and becoming a, a big market success because of this kind of stuff, right? No one likes doing repetitive tasks. All right, if there's nothing else, then I will be up here if you have any other questions you want to talk about one-on-one, -on -one, but thank you for coming.